contribution to uh, World Statistics Day. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, World Statistics Day before we uh, start. So on this World Statistics Day, this is uh, written by the Secretary General of the United Nations. I urge all partners and stakeholders to work together to ensure that the necessary investments and aid, adequate technical capability is built, new data sources are explored, and innovative processes are applied to give all countries the comprehensive information systems they need to achieve sustainable development. So the, the theme of uh, this second UN declared World Statistics Day, which has been uh, determined to be celebrated every five years, is uh, to emphasize the critical role of high quality official statistical information in analysis and informed policy decision making in support of sustainable development. It also reflects the importance of a sustainable national statistical capacity to produce reliable and timely statistics and indicators measuring a country's progress. So the Secretary General's message then goes on to say, good data and statistics are indispensable for informed decision making by all actors in society. As countries and organisations embarking on implementing the ambitious 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, reliable and timely statistics and indicators are more important than ever. So we need to ensure that everyone is counted, especially the most poor and vulnerable. No child's birth shall remain unregistered. No incidence of disease, no matter how remote the location, shall remain unrecorded. We need local statistics to ensure that every child has access to education, and we need global statistics to monitor the effects of overall effects of climate change. However, the monitoring requirements for the success of the Sustainable Development Goals pose a significant challenge to even the most developed countries. That's why they need us. So we need a data revolution. We need to strengthen statistical capacity and tap into the potential of new technology. We need the contributions and expertise of the data producers and users, academia, the private sector, and civil society. On this World Statistics Day, the Secretary General urges all partners and stakeholders to work together to ensure that the necessary investments are made, adequate technical capability is built, new data sources are explored, and innovative processes are applied to give all countries the comprehensive information systems they need to achieve sustainable development. So if we look at the words that I've highlighted here, we see a data revolution, tapping into new potential, the potential of new technology, the inclusion of civil society, new data sources and innovative processes. So the kind of information that we have in terms of the data revolution is growing. We all know this. We're all involved here in projects that involve different sources of data, different volumes of data, different complexities of the data. So data from remote sensing, data from brains, data from signals and sensors, data from census collections, data from observations, all different sources of information. And we need to make sense of that. How do we make sense of that? We do it through uh, considering this as our big data, our sources of various information of various sizes and complexity, and we use our tools, our statistics, to answer those questions. So we're going to use statistical methods and models and computational solutions to be able to address the demands and challenges that the Secretary General posed to us. So as you know, the people in this room know, we're part of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Maths and Stats Frontiers in big data, big models and new insights. And this is bringing together then the, uh, the areas of machine learning, applied and computational maths and statistics to address problems in theory, computation, methods and application in the areas of healthy and healthy people, sustainable environments and prosperous societies. So we're now a year into the centre and we have many of the people on board 
in the centre. It's now established and it's a time frame of about seven years. So we have an opportunity through this centre, through the six universities and the various partner organisations to really make a difference to the mathematical sciences, uh, methodology, uh, the, the discipline and also the application in the different areas of people, society and environment and we can do this through our efforts through the centre. So in our research group, this is my research group because there's all these other people over there watching as well. So um, in our research group here at Bragg, and most people in this room are in Bragg, so we have um, the Bayesian Research and Applications group. We're interested in Bayesian methods and models. We're interested in fast computation and problem solving in these particular areas, the same areas of environment, health and industry. So the Secretary General's message, as I said, says that we need a data revolution. We need to tap into the potential of new technology. We need the contributions and expertise of civil society. We need to explore new data sources and we need to apply innovative processes. So what I'd like to talk about is how we might do that through the virtual reality of statistics. So as you know, in this room, we have a, a brief overview of Bayesian statistics. So we have a current understanding about an unknown parameter, theta, and we're going to have some data that's going to um, be described through a likelihood. And then we're going to update our understanding about those unknown parameters or the models or the missing data or whatever that theta is, the unknowns in the model and the, and the um, system, given our data. And we're going to describe that through a posterior distribution and via Bayes' theorem. So what we have then, if this is a simple example which you all are aware, we have some observations from a population where we don't know, uh, we know it's normally distributed, we don't know the population mean. We have a prior which is going to be determined, uh, that, that expresses our understanding of that unknown population mean. Okay, so we might say that that is centered around one, with a variance of one. That's the, the variance then is a, a measure of our uncertainty about that unknown population mean. We take some data, a sample of data, and then we update our information about the population mean based on combining our prior information and our data. So if we do that, then we have a prior distribution, we combine it with our likelihood, and we obtain a posterior distribution, and that posterior distribution then can be used to directly estimate the, the quantities of interest to us. So the posterior mean and variance, credible intervals, the probability that a, parameter, that a parameter of interest is above a threshold and so on. So um, I feel really strange talking to <laughs> you guys, just you guys, but still, and that when I think Bayesian modeling is uh, most useful is when um, there's, no other, there's other information about our data that um, should be uh, considered when we're making inferences, when there are more complex models or inferences that we require, or when the data are sparse or non-existent. So how do we construct a prior then? We can use previous experiments, studies and surveys, we can use literature, and we can also use expert information. So here's an example of how we might use uh, information from the community, from this civil society that was mentioned by the Secretary General. So a study that I've been involved in for quite a while now is in uh, Indonesia, uh, in Kalimantan. So a survey of 700 villages and about 10 people per village, so this is about 7,000 villagers, and we're interested in how people view the forest and also the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, situation with orangutans, which are becoming a threatened species in that area. So we can use then spatial maps of modelled responses from the, the citizens of the area. We can use boosted regression trees and Bayesian additive regression trees. So what we wanted to do here was to build um, layers, if you like, layers of spatial layers of information across the area that could be combined with the economic information when there are decisions about management and land use. So, for example, with the uh, very active uh, increase in uh, forest or deforestation, then which areas should be deforested? At the moment, that is a 
um, squarely economic decision. But there are many more implications for deforestation than just economic. So there's the social and the health implications and also the con conservation implications. So can we build then not just economic layers across the area, can we also build social layers that involve how people view the forest, the value of the forest, the ecosystem services, and also the conservation layers as well. So that we can have a multi-dimensional decision making when we come to decide which areas of the forest should be cleared or managed in different ways across that landscape. So we can develop tree models, um, which uh, here, for example, we can look at non-parametric classification or regression. There's many different kinds of tree models. Uh, we can have our responses, for example, uh, cancer or no cancer as a, as a classification response. We might have a couple of predictors, for example, age and um, pack years of smoking, which would be X1 as age. And then we go through sequentially splitting our observations using those particular uh, covariates. So for example, if your age is greater than 80 years old, then you would go to the left of that plot there and you would see you are in the group that is, has a, a greater uh, propensity for cancer. If you're less than 80, but you're smoking more than two packs a day, you also have a high propensity for cancer. Whereas if you're in the other group, so you're less than 80 years old, and you are uh, smoking less than two packs a day, then your propensity is for no cancer. So these kinds of trees are very easy to read, very non-parametric way of segmenting our space as opposed to the more linear and parametric ways in um, regression models. So common models are our classification regression trees, boosted regression trees, and random forests. So we've talked about the CARC models, the boosted regression tree models, we, conduct a, we construct a sequence of single trees headed to the residuals of the previous trees to improve the uh, classification and prediction capability of the trees. We can also use random forests which fit to random samples of the data and then we average the prediction from those, random forests, uh, from those individual trees. Uh, we can use Bayesian models in this context, for example, Bayesian model averaging, where we have a weighted average of predictions from the individual trees, and our bark models, which sum the trees, using a prior that keeps the individual effects uh, small, so that each tree just explains a small and different part of the, um, the space. So then our Bayesian models can also incorporate spatial covariates, and we can call these geographically elaborated trees. So we can use these then for modeling the spatial layers that we want from the, uh, the Kalamantan study. So the kinds of information that we get, uh, so the kind of information we get is, for example, a classification regression tree on the reasons for killing orangutans. So the, uh, we see here, for example, that the dominant variable here is about the religion, the predominant religion in um, the village. And then after that, it's about how far away the forest is, what the forest composition is like around the village, and, uh, and then the, uh, the reasons you can see for killing orangutans range from medicine, food, self-defense, and so on. So this is a way then of being able to target spatial areas for management, uh, education, and improvement in the, the, uh, the issues of, um, of orangutan-human conflict. We can also use this, as I said, for developing spatial layers for cultural and spiritual benefits and from environmental benefits. So this is just an example of how we might use citizen information to be able to make differences in conservation. The second study is in prediction, and I wanted to talk about uh, the case where we have no data here. So we go from the case of big data to no data. And big, no data where we, is really a situation where prior information is extremely useful. And we see it very often. It's our, maybe our extreme values where we know that they exist, we just haven't seen them yet. Or a, a future event that we hope is not going to happen, but may happen. How do we build models? How do we uh, do prediction for that when we don't have any data? So we can use prior information and often in the form of um, analogous studies and also in, in people's expertise. So this study here is in Plant Health, uh, with Plant Health Australia, the National Bee Pest Surveillance Plan. So there's the bee up in the, the right-hand corner there. 
So what can you see in that picture? Where's the pest? What is it? Yes, that's right. So the pest there is this Varroa destructor. It's a mite that looks like this, climbs in and then uh, multiplies very rapidly and ends up decimating the bees. So bees climb all over the, the bees and uh, eventually kill the hive. So we have a picture of Australia there. Um, Varroa destructor is across the world except Australia. So New Zealand got to Baroa about six years ago, and so far it's been kept out of Australia. The um, Plant Health Australia would like to keep it that way. And that's the area of Australia there. So my question to you is, where would you put your surveillance efforts for bees? So the question here is about surveillance and being able to target high risk areas, and then to be able to develop methods for, uh, for detecting when Varroa arrives in a manner that it can then be contained. Okay, so this is another area where, um, sit, uh, where expert judgment rather than citizen judgment is very important. So using the information from the experts about this pest, about arrival and risk um, points, about the ways that we can manage for, uh, for bees across, across the country. So the first message is that expert information is important and the, the problem then is how do we actually represent this information as a prior distribution. So the case study here is in the brush-tailed rock wallaby. So this is a rock wallaby that um, was very prevalent in uh, Australia generally uh, about 100 years ago and now there's uh, about you know, 10,000 of them left. So. Um, the areas closer here, they used to be all across uh, Mount Cooper. Now uh, they, there's uh, areas in the, the uh, ranges between Northern Territory and, uh, sorry, Northern Territory, Northern New South Wales and Queensland, and then down through some pockets of New South Wales and into Victoria. So this is the kind of landscape where these rock wallabies live. And if we wanted to propose or develop uh, risk models or abundance or even presence absence maps of where these rock wallabies would live, then what's done at present is that people go out into these areas and identify where they might see them. So go to sites and do presence absence studies. So firstly, they're cryptic. Secondly, they're rare. Thirdly, it's very difficult to get out into these sites. So the question becomes, what can we do about it to increase the amount of information about these uh, these wallabies so that we can build better informed maps. So this is an example of, again, of the rock wallaby habitat. So typically they would take a helicopter over this area and then um, survey the area and then have to get in there on foot. So um, this is a, an example of a habitat suitability model. This is a presence only model that was um, built by a student based on the amount of information that was available. And um, you can see here the different kinds of maps that are showing high suitability areas um, down to low suitability areas. You can see there's very few high suitability areas. Now the question, or the, the comment that came in, um, in Chris's uh, honours thesis was the site assessments using expert opinion contrast considerably with the habitat model. So even though you can build the best habitat model based on the data, the experts may still have other information that hasn't been incorporated into that model. So how do we get at that information? So what we could do is elicit information on the regression parameters. So if we have a regression relationship, then we, the unknown parameters in that model are our betas. These are the regression parameters. In other words, the relationship between the x's and the y's. So we could actually ask information about the, the betas. So I could say these x's here might be aspect, slope, elevation, vegetation, and so on. So factors that are important or variables that are important for the, um, the presence of the wallaby. And so I could ask the team here who has become suddenly an expert in, uh, in rock wallabies, and I could say, Zing, what do you think the, uh, happens to that beta? Okay, what's the best estimate of beta here when I have values of elevation, uh, temperature, uh, rainfall, and um, uh, 
let's just say vegetation, okay? What would you expect to happen to that beta as for those particular values being set or as I increase some of those values? And then I would say, now that's for beta 1, let's move to beta 2, okay? So given the other variables in the model, what would you think would happen to beta 2? So you have to think about each of those variables in turn, but um, considering the other variables in the model, because as you know, if I drop one of those variables out, then all of those betas may change. Okay, so it's all conditional on the other information in the model. And so what I could do is say, given the other variables in the model, what's the impact of this particular variable on the presence of um, rock wallabies, and how certain are you about that, okay? So we could sit here for, if there are 52 variables there, we can sit here for quite a while and go through that. And that was the first way that we actually did this study. So we didn't have many friends left after trying that. Okay? The other way that we can do this is to elicit priors on the responses. So we can say, instead of doing that, we can say, let's have a look at a particular character site, the characteristics of a site. And for that site, tell me about the probability of um, presence at that site. So, and then if I have enough information for different characteristics, uh, different sites and their characteristics, and your your uh, probability of presence with the uncertainty around that, I can use that to build a predictive model based on your information. Okay, so that's where we're headed. So. What we can do then is we can represent the prior distributions depending on what they are. So we can represent them as null distributions. Uh, so that would be what's your best estimate and how certain are you and we can, we can translate that to variances. We can also represent those prior distributions, for example, if they're probabilities, what's the probability of presence, for example, as beta distributions. And so we then parameterize the beta distribution in terms of a mean and a variance again and then we can um, represent it as uh, you know, whether you know nothing. Uh, for example, you believe, well, know nothing, you believe all possible values, so any probability from zero to one is equally likely through to I have a really fair, firm idea of the probability and I'm very sure about that, for example, in the lower right. Okay? So different ways that we might represent this prior information. So expert information can be effectively represented as prior distributions and the question then is, how do we elicit this information? One of the things that we're also working on is how we actually combine this information as well. Um, I'll go through a bit further and otherwise I'll talk some more about that if the slides aren't here. So when we want to elicit information, we can train the experts prior to elicitation so that we calibrate them well with respect to probabilities. We then elicit typically using the outside-in method. If I just ask you about your best estimate with a plus or minus, um, then we can have the uh, problem with calibration. So what we can do instead is ask you about what's the worst and best estimates and then what are some realistic estimates and then what's the most plausible value. And we, we have a much better um, calibration uh, when we do that. So then we can record this based on however you feel most comfortable in terms of counts. So if you go to a site 10 times, how likely is it that you might see the the wallaby at that site, a percentage or a multiplicative factor. We can also, it's multiplicative factor being as twice as likely as another site. We can then encode that in these different kinds of distributions. So then we come to, so when we, before we get to the elicitation aids, I want to talk about combining the, um, the um, information. So now we have these different responses and so I might take, uh, we might have all of you in this room here as, a, as our rock wallaby experts, which would be wonderful because we don't have so many of them. But um, so we then want to combine your information. So there's a couple of ways that we can do that. One is we could get you all to agree. So we could do some sort of Delphi method where we all come up with a consensus for the probability of, um, of presence at the different sites. Okay. The other way is that we could take each of your estimates and then we could have some sort of averaging approach. Or we can come up with a more sophisticated pooling approach which then allows for uh, like a mixture model where we have distributions for each of your, uh, rep representing your um, responses and then we combine those in some sort of weighted manner. And the weighting can be based, for example, on how well you calibrated to a series of questions where the responses were actually known, the outcomes were known. So 
So that then gives us an idea of your expertise in the area and we can weight according to that. Okay, so then the weighting of the mixture is based on how your certainty about your results and your degree of expertise. So these kinds of, of combination methods for expert opinion are really important when we come then to combine them with the data. So we come now to the question of um, the elicitation aids. And uh, as I said, we've um, tried the asking about the regression coefficients and uh, that's quite difficult, so we're going to ask about the responses. So now the question is, I could ask Zing hypothetically to tell me about this, like I have this hypothetical site here, Zing, this table here becomes like a site, it has this kind of vegetation, this kind of aspect and so on. And you have to visualise all of that and tell me how likely it is that a rock wallaby would live on that table, okay? So, um, or I could put a map down and I can ask you, okay, seeing here on the map, tell me how likely it is at different points. Now, we actually started this long ago um, by using a map of Brisbane. And so we're trialling this because we didn't have many rock wallaby experts, but we had a lot of people who said, what do people actually know about? So we said, well, what about house prices in Brisbane? So many people who bought a house or sold a house or thinking buying a house will know about house prices. And so we said, well, in this suburb here, what do you think the average house price is? And how sure are you about it? Okay, and what about over here? And what about over here? And then the variables that we used for that were how far away from the river were you? And how close to the city were you? Okay, so that would be our two variables. And could we build then a predictive model based on um, your responses to house prices given how far that um, the sites were from the river and from the city. Does that make sense? And so then we could lay out that across all of the suburbs of Brisbane to give an estimate of house prices based on how far those, those places were from the city and from the river. Okay? And again, that's a nice example because we can calibrate it. So there were some people who were very particular, as you would find in experts. So they said, they said, well, it would be exactly like this value in this suburb and then this one and then this one. Because they said, what happens if when people get married, they move into this suburb and then they move over here and then they get more money and then they move over here. He said, no, that's too much information. We don't need all of that. It's just a higher level. So there's all sorts of things that go on when you ask experts for information. So that's a physical map. Now we could also use... Um, so the physical map would look like this, and we would be asking questions um, from the map. We can also use a um, digital, like GIS um, information. So here are our sites that we would ask Zing to, to um, uh, tell us about for each of these sites. And he would be then provided with any of the GIS layers uh, that represent vegetation, and elevation, and slope, and aspect, and so on. Um, that he could use then to tell us about the probability of rock wallabies. So um, here are some examples where we would be asking him about um, these sites and also along these trajectories as well. So we come now to the question of um, immersive environments and we want to use immersive environments then as a different way of getting at the information. So instead of having a map or instead of having a digital um, um, GIS, now we are able to make immersive environments. Now you sit, you can you know, get your TV now to, to show you things and you can have caves you may have seen in different places. We have the cube. So how do we use this new technology to help us elicit information? How much better would it be to have Zing in an environment where he can, instead of having to go out to the, uh, to the those remote areas in the, in the, um, the hills of or the mountains of um, or the mountains, the hills of uh, New South Wales, we could bring that landscape into the, the room with Zing. Okay, so instead of him having to go out to those sites, we can bring those sites to him. And so the question is, how can we do that? Well, we can build virtual environments, and we've done this with the rock wallabies based on the GIS information, where we have these kinds of environments. So what happens then is we build these and we then put Zing into that environment. And so the kind of technology that's used is like this. This is the, um, the VR, the virtual reality goggles. And so Zing would actually put these on. You can't see anything Zing, but you can show everybody what you look like, put them on. Okay. 
And what happens now, actually, is that we can, instead of um, having a virtual environment, we can actually take photos with this, and we can link this to the VR and um, to the goggles, and Z would be able to see in virtual environment or 3D what's happening here. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so these are the VR goggles that he would put on. He can then move around. As he moves around, he can see the landscape and he can then tell us how likely the rock wallaby is to live there. And we can actually simulate, for example, the helicopter noise if that primes him more than just using the goggles. So the studies that we're doing at the moment is how much more do we elicit from having a map, having a GIS layers, having the virtual environment and then having the noise as well, having the surround sound. And uh, this kind of priming for, uh, for understanding about expert judgment is really important uh, in, in, make, in being able to use this um, expert information. So um, here's an example that we get from the different experts, so different ways that they might um, uh, be able to tell us about the probability of uh, of presence of the uh, rock wallaby at the different sites for a normal screen and using the oculus. Some of the comments that we've had about the oculus is about its comfort, its orientation, and the field of view. So how you act, sometimes you feel, um, you can feel quite seasick when you wear it because of the movement inside the, the virtual environment. You can lose your orientation for where you are and what you can actually see um, in the, in, through the oculus. So and in building the landscape it can be quite tricky in the virtual environments because you need reality. So and it's, a, it's an interesting question. If you are not too real, people are actually quite comfortable. If you become more real, people then start to find a lot of faults with the signature building. So the more rea real you become, the sort of less people like it. It's almost like a robot. You no, know, a robot that doesn't look like a person but sort of looks androidish is okay, but as soon as it starts to become more human, you start to get threatened by it or you start to see it's non humans. And so it's the same thing with these um, virtual environments. So the rocks don't really look like the rocks that rock wallabies would live on. And it becomes very difficult to, to satisfy experts about what those rocks should look like in a virtual environment. So the other way that we can do that then to get over those problems is to use, for example, point cloud sources uh, and, uh, and uh, like LIDAR and laser and UAV. So we can fly over these areas with a, a, a drone, for example, take film and then use that to build the immersive environments. So um, with the UAVs, we've been doing this for, uh, for koalas. This is work that Sandra Johnson has been doing. Uh, with Philippe Gonzalez. And uh, this is the Australian News then, had the article that said aerial robots, artificial intelligence, and statistics revolutionise wildlife tracking and research. And, uh, and, and yeah, so we thought that was pretty cool that we had statistics in there as part of that. So then the other way that looking at this, this is to use mixed reality. So here again, we use, as I said, we use the mobile phone, the yeah, mobile phone, the VR headset, um, a GPS, and an accelerometer to be able to improve the visual experience, the virtual reality experience. The other thing that we're doing is looking at other sorts of technology as well. So the new reality now is through Microsoft HoloLens, um, Google and the GoPro 360-degree cameras, the GoPro Heroes, and the Google Cardboards, for example. So you can see here, here's an example of the um, of two <coughs> GoPros put together. You can see the two GoPros there. This is actually then going to give you a, a, three, um, a 3D or immersive um, environment. You can buy these now and people will be using these you know, regularly to build their sort of um, virtual reality worlds. But the thing is that all this tech exists, but the question is what do we do with it? So we want to be able to not just have the OOR factor, but we want to be able to then use these to build predictive models, so to improve our predictions. And that's where the stats comes in. Just to show you another example of the kind of 360 degree camera, 
Um, or this is not a 360 degree camera actually, the one on the right there is sort of like we've got these GoPros instead of just having two, we have eight of them for a 360 degree camera in a ball. And, um, and then you also have these little ones here. So this is a, like a, a, um, a, gives you a much wider angle and gives you the immersive environment for what's in front. Just that little one. And, uh, and the other one is just like a remote control. So you just hold it up and uh, it's just a little white elongated one. You press the button, it has two um, lenses on either side and it takes a 360 degree photo. Okay, so, um, so we have some people who are experts in this technology uh, now because we've been filming all sorts of things like weddings. And, uh, but what we've, um, uh, this is a lot of the work that Thomas has been doing in our group, so Thomas Bednarts and uh, Gavin Winter, uh, Ross Brown and um, Alan James and um, June Kim have been working a lot on the technology and then combining with Erin Peterson and uh, myself and Kevin Burridge to build the maths stats models. So, um, so the third message is that expert information can be effectively elicited using virtual reality and immersive environments and used for predictive modelling using Bayesian statistics. So the question now is how can we use this then for world statistics? Now the Australian Bureau of Statistics is actually in, um, in uh, well, members of the Australian Bureau of Statistics have been leading a global working party on using remotely sensed data for gathering official statistics. So instead of, for example, asking farmers to fill out forms, they want to use satellite data to estimate crop yields. And they're in Abu Dhabi at the moment at a conference across for an international conference for official statistics agencies, looking at ways that they might use remotely sensed data for, um, for um, gathering official statistics. So we are looking at the conservation of threatened species, as I said, and some of you may know that we're leaving for Peru on Friday to do some more of that and we'll be able to hopefully tell these stories when we hopefully come back um, after a month there um, about how that's gone with this new technology. So again, using this new technology to, uh, to be able to elicit information in a, in a better way and to be able to use it for predictive models. So the second example is through monitoring the barrier reef and this is a project that's now just started with the um, CRC for Spatial Information, Department of Natural Resources and um, AIMS, Australian Institute for Marine Sciences. The barrier reef is the size of Italy and so the question of monitoring it, uh, for example, to meet UNESCO demands that we have a good management plan in place by the end of next year. Well, what we've got is um, a lot of data, we've got 10 years of data, but only very sparse data at just very, um, a very, well, relatively few locations given this, the expanse of the reef. But what we do have are the people on the left there, lots of recreational divers. So we have divers down there with their GoPros taking films. So what if we took the GoPros and we tagged their photos to the reef? So we can geolocate their photos and films to the reef. We can take our experts, so Zing has now become suddenly an expert in, um, in uh, marine science as well as ecology. He does well, doesn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So pass it around if you want people to see. And, um, and so he is now going to be able to go to those photos and films um, and make determinations about water quality, about coral cover, biodiversity and the presence perhaps of crown of thorns, starfish. So that then we can take, because we know the characteristics of those sites and the metadata attached to them, then we can uh, use that information to again build predictive models for those um, responses and lay those out across the reef. So imagine now that over here we would have the, um, the digital reef here with the, the uh, films tagged to it the expert will come along and examine one of those films. They would provide information, like, um, prior information as we've, been, as we've talked about here. And then over there would be the, the results of the predictive model that would be changing as they provide the information. So we have this updated information um, that's going to be then changing as they 
um, update the films and then the, the, um, the estimates and the, the elicited um, information. And so then that would show then, for example, areas of risk um, and areas where the, um, the, health is, uh, the reef is healthy and uh, the reef is under threat. So coming back then to the Secretary General's me uh, message, uh, we are trying through this technology to really address, actively address, the questions of new data sources and innovative um, processes that can be applied then to give all countries these kinds of information systems, much more comprehensive information systems they need to achieve sustainable development. So, happy World Statistics Day, everybody.